Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Evolved Man Masterclass. Today, I'm super excited to have with me Dr. John Schinnerer. How are you doing, John? Good. How about you, Ben? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for joining me. It's an honor to have you. Uh, I want to introduce you a little bit. You are a high-performance coach who teach men scientifically proven tools to achieve positive, long-term change in behavior for themselves, their relationships, and their professional life. That sounds awesome. Seems like we could all use that. It works for a lot of my clients. <laughs> awesome. Um, so you probably always weren't always a high performance coach. Let's uh, let's drop back into uh, the superhero origin story so we can learn a little bit about you. Okay, let me give you the the brief Reader's Digest version. So um, back in high school, um, I tended to be an overachiever because my parents were both high performers, overachievers. Okay. Um, senior in high school, I was student body president, captain of three varsity teams, uh, taking AP classes. And I'm sure from the outside looking in, it looked great. From the okay. inside, my internal experience was I was depressed part of the time. I was anxious a lot of the time. I was stressed. I was tired. I, was, I wasn't that happy. And so at the age of 17, I started looking at what is this definition of success? What, you know, all the adults are telling me to do this thing to pursue success. Right. My experience was there was no room in success for things like happiness, relaxation, contentment. I guess there was some room for purpose, but it, it started me questioning the whole idea at a young age. Yeah, well, it sounds and, like you're doing that much in high school. That, that gives me stress and anxiety just, just thinking about yeah. all that stuff going on was, at once. It was, it was great and awful at the same time, right? I was rewarded for it heavily, but I was killing myself doing it. Right. And so, it, I mean, it worked. It got me into a good college. And, you know, after college, I got into UC Berkeley in the PhD program in psychology, educational psychology. And really, my interest was in emotion. Okay. Because I've always been, you know, a smart kid, more or less. But I knew that the dumbest, most embarrassing, most shameful things I'd done in my life were all when the emotional mind was in charge of me. Right. And it really bothered me. Like, I just couldn't get a handle on them, right? Um, and so I went into Berkeley thinking, you know, I want to learn more about these emotions, emotional intelligence, emotional management. Didn't really learn much about it at Cal because it was all about cognitive psychology. So right. became a school psychologist, um, started working with kids. The best part of my job was seeing high school students that would come in and tell me their stories. And at the time I was in a pretty rough town and you're dealing with, you know, kind of the, the lower end of, of that town. and their stories had a lot of emotion in them, fear, right. anger, sadness, guilt, shame. And it, I didn't realize at the time, I was about 26, that emotions are contagious. So without training, you pick them up from other people, you know, if you're empathic at any level, which right. I am. And so I would just pick up their emotions and it, no one really taught me to defend myself against them or how to get rid of them. So it ended up with me getting depressed. When you get depressed, inflammation in your body goes up. So my back goes out. So I remember I was laying on the floor of my office thinking, this is ridiculous. Here I am a psych, I'm trained at Cal, and I can't manage my own emotions. Right. And so at that point, I made a, a conscious decision to learn the best scientifically proven tools to kind of manage that darker side of things, the, the negative emotions, so to speak. And that worked for a while. Um, it was half the solution. Okay. And then I went to, I left school psychology and did an entrepreneurial venture, um, basically doing online pre employment testing for large companies. Right. So I did that for a few years. That worked until the economy tanked and then my business went down in flames. So I had to reinvent myself. So I started studying positive psychology, um, which to me was like manna from heaven. It was amazing because it's all about pretty much the scientific study of happiness. Right. How do you cultivate more positive emotions? Why should you care about positive emotions? How do you find more purpose and meaning in life? Kind of like what you're doing. Right. And so I read, I don't know, a thousand studies and I compulsively wrote out like a 600 page book on how to coach people towards a successful and happy life. And then I happened to go to a, a Christian businessman's networking breakfast in the city in San Francisco, which is kind of a weird place for me. I consider myself spiritual. I'm not crazy about organized religion. That's just my bias. Right. Uh, happened to sit next to a guy who owned a radio station, 
we met a few times. He said, Hey John, I want to put you on the air, which okay. that idea terrified me. You know, part of my makeup, I got a little bit of depression. I got a little bit of anxiety. So there's a lot of things in life that I was afraid of, but I also knew from about the age of 16 that if I was afraid of it, then I had to go after it. And so I was like, great, I'll, I'll do a live radio show, you know, <laughs> and it was funny because Cal had taught me that the only things I could say or everything that I say has to be backed up with research studies, right. which really puts a kink in your flow. You know, it doesn't lend itself to easy storytelling if you're going, oh, wait, is there a study to back that up? Mm. So I was pretty bad in the beginning. And this was a live daily primetime show with, I mean, a huge signal, right. which also created more anxiety. But over time, I could relax into it. I got better. I learned how to tell a joke in a vacuum, more or less, how to tell a story. <laughs> um, got to interview some world-class experts, which was awesome. And did that for a year, stopped, opened up private practice, published part of the book, which got an award, which was pretty exciting. And the next chapter was, I've always been a geek. So right. a geek in the best sense of the word. So I've been playing around with computers since I was 12. So I could do a lot on the web. So I've had, I've had blogs, I have a few websites up. And so I took this class on how to monetize your knowledge for the web, basically how to create online courses. Right. So the first one I did was anger management for men. They said, find a niche. I was like, all right, there's got to be millions of men out there that need these tools that maybe don't have the money to come in and see me, don't live nearby, or don't have the courage to come in and see someone because that's mm -hmm. a pretty big problem for us men. And so I went live with it. Um, a couple things happened that were really interesting. One is I started getting hundreds of emails from angry women all around the world pretty much saying, hey, look, we're angry too. I was like, all right, it wasn't personal. They just told me to find a niche. Like, It's not about you. But I changed it. I made it gender neutral. Um, now, and then, are there more angry men or women out there, just out of curiosity? You know, honestly, it's about the same. Okay. I would say it's like 55, 45, but there's a lot of angry women out there. Okay. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that. And we can go into that in another show if you'd like. But um, so... The next class I did was anxiety management, and then I did a positive psychology course. Um, but the, the anger management led to, I got a call, I guess six, seven years ago, and it was a, an EA, an executive assistant at Pixar. And she right. said, can you talk to a producer here at Pixar? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Maybe they're angry or anxious. I don't know. Right. So I get on the phone. He says, hey, this is Jonas Rivera. You know, I produced this movie called Up. Uh, maybe you've heard of it. I'm like, yeah, I think I own it. I have four kids. I knew I owned it. I was trying to be a little bit cool. Uh, he's like, oh, great. Well, me and Pete Doctor, Pete directed up. We're working on a new movie, and we're wondering if you'd come down and kick some ideas around with us. Right. Like, yeah, I think I can fit that in my calendar. Yeah, let me and see. So I got <laughs> down and, and consult with them for about, you know, for, for a day. So I was one of three expert consultants on that movie, Inside Out, and the it was a great experience. I mean, people have asked me, well, wow, did you dream of that as a kid? I'm like, <laughs> I don't think I could have dreamt of that. Like it wasn't even in my wheelhouse. Right. Just, I got, um, so yeah, that's kind of the backstory. And since we're talking about anxiety, let me just back up for a second. And, you know, I've always been slightly anxious and I, I think the anxiety in general is a good thing. It's not a bad thing because it's driven me to achieve and it can be used as a source of motivation. Right. Um, but when I first got into the PhD program at UC Berkeley, my class was five people. Right. So it was very small. And we had a new student orientation. And I remember we, and there was several programs there. So there was about 40 people there. There's some professors and some older students. And we broke up to do kind of cocktail chatter, just kind of mingling. And I found myself in a conversation with a seventh year student, which meant he'd been at Cal in a PhD program for seven years. And the only thing I could think of to say was, so what's your dissertation on? Okay. And I swear to God, he starts talking. And after about eight or nine words out of his mouth, I had no idea what this guy was saying. <laughs> and immediately the thoughts started coming. I'm not worthy. I'm not smart enough. I don't belong here. And then, you know, perspiration, heart rate goes up. My throat felt tight, chest felt tight. I'm like, I got to get out of here. And so I, I just 
excused myself and ran to the bathroom to try and figure out what the hell was going on. The funny thing was, the thing I didn't know was most professors at Cal didn't understand this guy's dissertation either. Okay. It was just at such a high level, I just had the misfortune of picking the wrong guy to, to talk to. Um, but that was Maybe I'm first. not cut out for this. <laughs> What's that? And you're like, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Yeah. Well, and yeah, I mean, I, I really thought that. And the funny thing was, though, it was those thoughts that fueled that panic attack. And, you know, the first one you have is scary as hell because you're like, I mean, I've had clients tell me I thought I was going crazy. I thought I was dying. I thought I was having a heart attack. But once you know what's going on, you're like, oh, okay, so I'm having a panic attack. Yeah, I've been here before. This is going to pass in a little bit and we can move on. So that was my first real experience with, oh, maybe, maybe there's a little anxiety in me. All right. And then that kind of brings us to, to today's topic of, of anxiety. So it's a nice, nice segue into it. So what are, the, what are the causes of anxiety? I think you hit on it a little bit. And um, how, does, how does one manage it? I'm sure those are, those are two big questions. But Well, I mean, just to back up a little bit, I you know, I looked up some stats for this interview and it's interesting that overall lifetime prevalence of anxiety in the U S 33% of women will have an anxiety disorder. About okay. 20% of men will have an anxiety disorder in their lifetime. Um, it's the biggest health issue or the men biggest mental health issue in the United States right now. There's over 40 million adults that struggle with anxiety. And I, I think that it's, particularly difficult for men because it does affect our perception of our own masculinity. Right. And I've talked to a lot of men about that. Um, so anxiety in general is not one single disorder. It's actually a number of disorders, but there's some commonalities that they all have. For instance, um, they all have an emotional component. So they all have these irrational fears. Right. They all have feelings of dread or danger or worry. There's a cognitive component. So you have these negative thoughts that come with it. I'm not worthy. I'm not smart enough. I don't belong here. Right. That, those are some common ones. Um, and then there's physical elements to it. So you've got frequent tension, muscle tension. You've got, you might have nausea. You could have dizziness, shortness of breath, might be agitated. Um, Perspiration is a big one for those I talk to. Um, and you might see an increase in your heart rate. Okay. So, so I mean, one, one question I have is, how does one differentiate between general anxiety and a, and a disorder? Well, generally, if it lasts more than one week, I think you want to look at, you want to go talk to someone. Okay. Um, but there's a number of types of anxiety. So there's panic, there's panic attacks, which I just described one. Then right. there's panic order, which is having panic attacks kind of ongoing. Um, then there's phobias, spiders, clowns. And one of the ones that cracks me up is zombies because they don't actually exist, but it's, it's one of the top fears for some reason. Interesting. Um, I mean, it can be a nuclear wars, planes, bridges. There's all sorts of things we can be phobic of. Um, there's social phobia, which that's the one I think I've had, which is you, you get very uncomfortable in social situations, large groups. Right. But there's a component of it where you really don't want to be judged negatively by people, particularly people in a position of power over you. So doctors, psychologists, police, professors. Um, and so then you begin to start to avoid those situations where that might happen. Um, the other ones are like obsessive compulsive disorder where you have repetitive anxious thoughts right. um, or compulsions where you are doing behaviors over and over again to try and make yourself feel safer. Um, turning off the stove, turning door handles, um, checking your belt repeatedly, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's also PTSD, which is anxiety, specific kind of anxiety caused by trauma. Um, and then there's generalized anxiety disorder, which is kind of ongoing, frequent feeling of anxiety in a variety of situations. Okay. So you can kind of begin to narrow it down in terms of which one affects you most by looking at the different kinds of anxiety. The other thing to bring up in that aspect is there are issues which mimic anxiety that you want to rule out if you think anxiety is a possibility for you. So asthma or respiratory disease, whenever I see someone with asthma, there's usually an anxiety link. Okay. So you want to be aware of that. You want to be aware of steroid use, thyroid issues, um, medications that act as stimulants. 
So I've seen a number of people that are on like ADHD medication, which is stimulants. And, right. you know, that can lead to feelings of anxiety. The other big one I see with teenagers and millennials is energy drinks and caffeine. So Kickstarter, Monster, Red Bull, that's like an anxiety attack in a, in a can. Right. So you have to be aware of, did I just have an energy drink? Is that what's causing my heart rate to increase? Um, the other one is alcohol. So I've also had some, a couple of clients that drink to excess. They wake up in the morning. They're like, oh my God, I'm having an anxiety attack because you know, you're, you're, and they're actually having a hangover, but they're misinterpreting that as anxiety. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, what's interesting is if I have to think from, from personal experience, um, I mean, we all feel anxiety in some form or another and, and not to say that I have a disorder, but I can definitely identify with the hangover, um, increasing anxiety. I can identify yeah. with, um, you know, social situations bringing up anxiety, but I guess there's a certain threshold when that's like normal human behavior and a certain threshold where it becomes a, a disorder as you're talking about. Yeah, and I think it's a great point that you bring up that anxiety is an emotion that we all feel, and it is normal. I mean, like if you're going to go speak in front of a thousand people, you're probably going to feel some fear, some anxiety. Um, and if it prevents you from engaging in life frequently or over and over, or if that anxiety lasts for more than a week, then I think it's a good idea to go talk to someone. Right. One of the questions I have is, a lot of people, like when I talk about like purpose work and people trying to figure out, you know, uh, they may be in a job they don't like, but then they're anxious about being able to switch into something else. And that may stop them from doing it, but it's not like a, uh, this is keeping me um, from my normal living of life, right? Um, how would you classify something like that? I think that's pretty normal anxiety. I think that you know, one of the things I try and remind my clients of is that old idea of being courageous and that courage is not the absence of fear. It's the overcoming of your fear and anxiety. So it's doing what you know you need to do regardless of how you feel. Um, I mean, there's a great uh, quote. I think it's Michael Phelps who says that, you know, good athletes practice when they feel like it. Great athletes practice regardless of how they feel. And so I think, you know, with my clients, I'm always telling, trying to get them to in many ways, pay less attention to what they feel if the feelings are debilitating. They, right. Yeah, okay, well, I understand that you're feeling anxiety, and let's go ahead and do what you need to do despite the anxiety. I, I mean, one of the best ways through it, one of the best ways to deal with anxiety is to go through it. Right. And usually when those of us that have some anxiety or an anxiety disorder will give too much power to the anxiety and will kind of will pull back from life or will pull back from the situation. And that's so, not the best approach. Probably not. So, I mean, I, I think you're, you, you've answered it to a certain degree, but what are like the, the tools and the approaches to um, dive into that, right? Because I think it's probably walking into fear is a great kind of mantra and way to live. Uh, but then thinking about how do you actually put that into practice? Are there specific tools and methodologies for, for overcoming it? Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the, one of the things you want to work on is to become aware of how the autonomic nervous system works, how your body works. Right. Um, for instance, so the autonomic nervous system is a bundle of nerves that runs from the brain stem through your spine. And that will split into two separate systems. So you have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. I'll make this real brief. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for stress. Right. So activating your system, it's energizing you, it's the fight or flight response. Right. So where it comes out of the woods, that SNS gets activated, you feel fear, you run away. We're all very good at that in this day and age. The other part of that is the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's responsible for slowing things down, digestion, healing your body. It's the rest and digest response. It's the relaxation response. What I find is most of the people I talk to are not very good at that. And right. if you think of our body is a car, the sympathetic nervous system is kind of like the accelerator, the gas, the parasympathetic is the brakes. So it's kind of like we're one of those old muscle cars that really easy to get up to high speed, really hard to slow down. Right. And so I think that we all would benefit from working on 
learning tools for relaxation. Um, so, you know, how do you do that? I mean, one of the things I think you want to do with anxiety is look for it in your body. A large part of anxiety is neck down. Right. And when I was younger, I was a big fan of Descartes who said, I think therefore I am. And Descartes did not do us any favors <laughs> because he separated mind from body. And I was always looking for emotions up here in my head. Well, they, they are to a small extent, but mostly they're embodied. They're in our physical body. So, you know, if, if you want to be on top of anxiety, if you want to know when you're beginning to get anxious early on, which is a right. good idea, you want to pay attention to muscle tension, um, tightness in the chest, tightness in your throat, shortness of breath, heart rate. And those are all things that you can train yourself to tune into. So if you think of anxiety on the one through 10 scale, you want to get on anxiety early. And when it's at a one, two, or three, and you know, you can ask yourself, well, gee, I'm starting to feel a little bit anxious, a little nervous. What's going on? Is there a cause for that? What can I do about it? And there's a number of things you can do. Some are quite simple, like reminding yourself to take a deep breath. Right. So just doing something like breathing out longer than you breathe in, we know that activates the parasympathetic nervous system. So, you know, breathe in for four seconds, hold it for one or two, breathe out for six just that will begin to calm you down. Um, as far as the cognitive element, the thinking part, uh, there's a very powerful concept that I came across recently that's, it's this idea that it's the second thought that is the most powerful. Okay. And that's taken from CDT, from cognitive behavioral therapy. And my interpretation of that is, the longer I've done this work, the more I've realized that our minds are merely random thought generating machines. Okay. They just sit there and they spit out thoughts. Sometimes they're helpful. Sometimes they're destructive. Sometimes they're sane. Sometimes they're crazy. Sometimes good. Sometimes bad. And I don't identify myself as that mind anymore. I think of myself as kind of John floating above my mind, looking down saying, oh, there's that thought again of I'm an idiot. Or there's that thought again of I'm worthless. I've seen that before. Let me see, is there any objective evidence to back that up? Well, I got pretty good grades. You know, I wrote a book, got a PhD. Yeah, I don't think there's any evidence for that. I'm just going to let that go. Right. And I, I know that might sound a little bit funny, but I've actually had that thought of I'm an idiot in more colorful terms than that after getting a PhD. Right. So the thoughts are always going to come. They don't stop. You can't stop the thoughts. What you can do is change how you relate to the thoughts. So I, I like that idea of it's the second thought that's the most powerful because at this stage of my career, I believe that you and I are that second thought, the one that can challenge it, the one that can look for evidence, the one that can question, or the one that can come up with like affirmations, kind of very positive statements. I am worthy. I am smart. I do belong here. That sort of thing. Yep. Yeah, no, I just want to underscore that because I think it is valuable to uh, bring awareness to the different voices in your head. Um, and they can be that, that critic, the, uh, the brand consultant worried about looking bad um, and giving them names and giving them identities can allow you to say, oh, there's, um, you know, there's my self bully again or whatever. Um, and I think that that's a, it's an important piece so you can understand what, what is, um, kind of your, your bad programming that you need to debug and, and program over versus uh, a genuine, useful thought. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think putting labels on those different voices works really well. Speaking to them as if they're separate from you works really well. Like it, we're tra trained to do that for depression or anxiety. It's not, I have anxiety or I am anxiety. It's, gee, I'm feeling anxious. And you can speak to that anxiety as some, someone outside of you. Right. Um, for instance, go tell your anxiety to take a long walk off a short pier kind of thing. Um, but you know, the, the other part the, to your point, I think, I think one of the fundamental skills is something along the lines of mindfulness, because right. what I see in a lot of clients is many of us don't have a very good grasp of what's going on internally, what's going on in our mind. So you ask them, you know, I can ask clients to, you know, write down the negative thoughts that they're having. Many of them who are adults will say, I, I don't know that I have any. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you do. 
Um, and so there's an awareness piece that when I first started doing this work, I found it really difficult to catch those negative thoughts. Right. You know, they're very fast. They're very pernicious. They're, they're, there's layers of thought going on. And until you kind of quiet things down, and really pay attention, I think it's hard to, to catch those thoughts, to be aware of them so that you can challenge them. Yeah, no, I mean, I've definitely had the experience where I catch myself thinking something and I'm like, oh my God, I'm ridiculous. Um, I remember being at a job, logging in, have the wrong password. I'm like, oh, I'm getting fired now. They're, they're, they're locking me out of the system right now. You know, just like ridiculous thoughts or someone's talking about you over there and you're like, why are they talking about me? <laughs> like, yeah. When, so the other thing that I'll, I just did a presentation for this uh, at at and yesterday where so I, I don't have a graphic right now, but if you can imagine, um, so you're familiar with past, present, future. Yes. So put those into two, two rows and then put positive past, positive present, positive future, negative past, negative present, negative future. Okay. So that's a really simple framework that you can lay over your mind and ask yourself, what's my mind trying to do to me right now? Where's my mind trying to take me? Right. And a lot of people will spend time in a negative present, which is a pessimistic interpretation of the present moment. And we know that pessimism is closely related to depression. Right. It's not quite the same thing, but pessimism will fuel depression. Then the mind kind of takes you against your will to the negative past. So bad stuff that happened to you in the past, mistakes you made, things you think shouldn't have happened to you. Um, and we know that the more time you spend there, and if you dwell there, that pretty much is depression. Right. But anxiety is all about the negative future. It's forward looking, it's anticipatory, it's dread, which is anticipatory worry. And we're really good at spinning those stories, kind of to what you said of what's gonna happen tomorrow when I have a presentation at work. And you know, a lot of this stuff happens at night when you put your head on your pillow and that's you know, kind of when the carnival kicks into high gear and your mind just starts chattering at you. And, you know, I can, I can destroy the world in my mind in two seconds if I let it go unchecked. You know, oh, my God, I got this presentation at work tomorrow. I'm going to screw it up. And if I screw it up, like, the boss is going to be angry at me. If he's angry at me, then he's going to fire me. And if he fires me, I'm not going to have any money. If I don't have any money, then I'm going to be out on the street. I'm going to be homeless. And I'm naked. I'm going to be an empty bottle of Jack Daniels. And then an asteroid is going to come and hit the earth. And then everyone's going to die. I mean, it's that's an exaggeration. But, <laughs> but you, know, you know those thought trains, right, that we get yeah. on that are kind of ridiculous but we buy into them. We believe them. And so, you know, one of the things you can do when you get on those trains is you can play the probability game. Right. Okay, so what's the probability that I screw up my presentation? Well, I prepared for it. So I don't know, 3%. What's the probability that my boss will get angry at me if I do? Eh, I don't know, decent. What's the probability that I get fired for a bad presentation? Well, that's, you know, 0.0001%. Right. And so you can kind of, as you learn the skill, you can kind of learn to interrupt those thought trains, but that's also where the mindfulness comes into play because you can have that thought of, Oh my God, I'm going to screw up this presentation. If you're on top of your thoughts in the moment, you can say, well, is that really true? Well, I prepared for it. Yeah. Let's see how it goes. And, and so the mindfulness becomes really critical because a lot of times our minds, our attention is not in the present moment. Right. If you're not in the present moment, you don't really have a chance to stop in any of this stuff. And we know from studies that about 50% of our time, we're either in the past or the future. And we also know that that wandering mind is associated with more misery. So, you know, to me, mindfulness or some form of meditation is a critical skill for everyone to learn simply to bring themselves back to the present moment more frequently. I mean, there's other reasons as well, but that's one of yeah. the main ones. Well, you know, from, from a guy who, who uh, has anxiety, I know meditation for me has been extremely important. And, you know, I can feel the days when I don't meditate versus the, the ones that I do. And the level of agitation goes down, like the ease and flow uh, improves. So, you know, I can second that as a, as a practice that's improved my life. And one of the other guys in the summit is a, is a meditation teacher. So uh, for you guys that, that have been there or not, um, that, that's part of this as well. Yeah. Well, and I think the other thing that mindfulness does for us is it teaches us attentional control. Right. So we know that attention and emotion are closely linked. So if you can manage your attention better, you can manage what, how you feel better. 
Right. Yeah. Um, and, and then I think just like a quick meditation disclaimer, a lot of people give up because their attention wanders um, and just driving home the fact that the, the practice of coming back is, is, is the repetitions that you're doing, not the amount of time that you don't have a thought. So that's just a disclaimer for the, for the frustrated meditators out there. Yeah, and, and the goal is not to shut off your thoughts. The goal is to keep bringing your attention back from those thoughts to the present moment, to your breath, or whatever you're focusing on. Right. Um, the other one I like, like if we're talking about things to do to help you with anxiety or help people with anxiety, is visualization. Okay. So we know from you know, sports psychology for the past 60 years that visualization improves sports performance. We've only found out recently why that is. But basically, we... It, Visualization works because our brain doesn't tell the difference very well between what's real and what's imagined. Okay. About almost 90% of the same areas of the brain activate when you look at a red Corvette and imagine a red Corvette. Right. So from that, they've concluded that the brain's very literal. And so you can do things like, you know, practice deep breathing. And when you're doing that, pretend, visualize, imagine white smoke or white light coming in through your nose. And that white light contains whatever it is you need, relaxation, peace, love, worthiness. And then when you breathe out, you breathe out black smoke, and that contains whatever you want to get rid of, anger, okay. anxiety, stress. And that's one that I've had a lot of success with. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. I've, I've not heard that one. So just to reiterate, to make sure it drives the point home for me, you're uh, imagining what you need going into you. So let, let's say it's like confidence or, or calm, and then you, you know, breathe out the, the negative thoughts or the, the, the worry or fear about something. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then, you know, one other story, which I, I really like is um, there's a hall of fame boxing trainer. His name's Cus D'Amato. Yep. And he, you know, yep. Okay, so he's trained some of the greatest heavyweight fighters and some other fighters of all time, including Mike Tyson. Right. And when Mike, the story goes, when Mike first had his first professional boxing match, he was in the training room, the, the changing room, and was scared out of his mind, which that's a completely normal human reaction. Like, that makes sense to me. Yep. If I'm getting in the ring with someone that wants to destroy me, I'm going to feel some fear. Uh -huh. and you know, the story goes that Cuss told him, like, look, you got to think of fear as a friend, an ally. If you had a friend that saved your life several times a day, you wouldn't fear him. You wouldn't put him down. You would handle right. him as a superhero. And that's what fear is doing. Fear causes you to jump back onto the curb when the car is coming. Right. Fear causes you to run away when there's, you know, I don't know, a pit bull chasing you. And... You know, so I think to recast fear as a hero or a function, something that serves us is a great, a great reframe. Right. And then I guess it's just um, understanding how to interpret that fear, whether that's a walk through it fear or a run away from it fear. Right. Well, and I think we know, I mean, some fears are life and death or literally life and death. The problem is in this day and age, we interpret so many things as a life or death situation. And, you know, getting a good grade on a test is not a life or death situation. Getting into the right college, not a life or death situation. Getting right. a promotion, not life or death. So we got to kind of check those. And, and one of the questions I tell my clients to ask themselves is, is this a life or death situation? Because most times the answer is no, in which case you can kind of take a deep breath and calm yourself down. The, the other question I really like is, will this matter in five years? Right. Just to self perspective and again you can use it to calm down negative emotions because most times the answer is no it's not that big a deal if the answer is yes then by all means go ahead and act on it right you know, do something. but most times we're getting annoyed like you know someone cuts us off in traffic and you get angry like is that going to matter in five years no you're not even going to remember it right so we've talked about how to address anxiety um, how easy is it then to transition from someone being able to address anxiety into uh, performing at a, at a high level? Like, are there, is that, is that a transition that you can bring people through? Or are there certain set levels between different people in their performance? How does that work? I, I think part of that depends. It's a really good question. And I think you can go from being anxious to being a high performer 
part of it depends on your mindset. Part of it depends on your motivation to change. Because right. I've had some clients that are open to change and will, will actively practice the tools I teach them. Right. And then the sky is the limit. I've also had some clients that will tell themselves, I can't do this. This is me. I'm just anxious. Right. Okay. Well, what's your motivation to change? Not that much. Right. Well, I mean, what do you expect? I mean, so I think at some point, and those are just decisions. Right. And, you know, part of it is that fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. And, you know, if you have a fixed mindset about your anxiety, that this is just me, love me or leave me, it's never going to change. All right, God bless you. You're right. And if you have a growth mindset, which means that you believe that through hard work, perseverance, and repeated effort, you can get better and change these habits, then yeah, you'll be able to do that. Nice. How much of your work is, is going back into past stuff? Uh, one of the things when I've done some, some work um, into myself is like there was a, a belief at, at some certain point where um, I figured out working with somebody that like the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. Mm. And that became something that um, became like a, a rule of thumb for me. Now I'm aware of it. I can... Uh, you know, act around it, climb over it, but kind of a, a block. How much of that work is figuring out what those old blocks are? Um, some of it, not too much. I don't spend a whole lot of time in the past. Um, okay. If someone's really stuck, we'll go back and look at that. I think that, you know, when I go back to the past, it's often about some, some trauma. Right. I'll go back and try and help my client to pull out what's the meaning or the lesson learned, or the positive, the silver lining. Right. Um, and part of it's just, you know, sometimes it's just, gee, I survived that. If I survive that, I can survive anything. Right. Like, you know, anything that comes in the future is going to be cake compared to what I've already been through. And, you know, while that's not exactly true, it's a really powerful thought to have. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think I've, uh, in, in some other work that I've done, if you look at those things that have a negative charge in your past, and, and like you said, figure out what are the lessons that I need to learn from this that I haven't learned yet, um, and, and get clear that that's a, a gift, and that once you have the lesson, that, that charge decreases, and it loses some of its um, uh, power over you. Yeah. Yeah, and so, I mean, to kind of answer your question about going into the past, I think I would rely more on that fixed versus growth mindset approach and try and get a client to buy into the idea that it's through, you know, repeated effort, perseverance, and continued trying, and uh, just choosing to have the belief that change is possible. Nice. And uh, when we talk about changing beliefs, I know um, some people use affirmation, some people like write things down. How do we reprogram ourselves? Well, I, I think those are both good ideas. I mean, I think that the first step to me is writing down the negative thoughts and coming up with specific challenges to those, at least right. the, the major ones that you have. So that's kind of, because we have that negativity bias. So we know that the negative is three or four times as powerful as the positive in our mind. Right. So with training, we naturally focus on negative emotions, negative thoughts, negative self-definitions, like I'm a jerk. Um, or negative things that, that people think about us or we think they think about us. So I think we've got to get a handle on those. And then to get more positive thoughts in there, I think, yeah, the writing stuff down, I mean, you can write stuff down on a three by five card, put it on your bathroom mirror. You can do repetition. You can do guided meditation. Um, there was, I was looking at some sports psychology recently and I thought this was pretty wild that there's college teams and pro teams that in order to get their players in the right headspace for a big game, will actually create a montage of their highlights <laughs> with an announcer reading over, like, you know, kind of doing play by play. Right. And they'll sit them in a chair and have them watch this over and over and over again. So here's you at your very best. Here's you at your best moments. Take this in, believe it. That's awesome. Um, there's also another one I do for athletes. You can use it in different areas, but. It's called the circle of power. Again, it's a visualization exercise. But basically it's, you know, imagine yourself playing your sport at your very best. So let's say it's baseball. So imagine yourself hitting a home run. Right. Now, what I want you to do is when you have that picture in your mind, hit pause, like you're hitting pause on a DVD player. Okay, you got that picture in mind. 
Now I want you to imagine a circle around you on the ground in your mind's eye. It can be any color you want. Just see the circle. Right. And then using your imagination, I want you to pick that circle up, take it outside of you and put it down around right here right now. And just that simple exercise helps put you in the zone. Okay. So it tells your brain that you're in the same physiological state as you were when you were hitting that home run, for example. And I've, I've done this with swim teams, soccer teams, baseball teams, basketball teams. And I actually tracked the results of swimmers one summer. Right. And the results were astounding. Like 90% of the swimmers that I taught this to dropped time significantly. And then, awesome. then they plateaued because it's a tool, right? And the tool helps you drop and then you need more tools. That's cool. Um, awesome. What, what else have we not covered that's, that's important to about anxiety as we, as we help men evolve? Um, one of the things that I see that's a drawback of, of anxiety is it's often related to perfectionism. Right. And I've seen people get hung up on this isn't perfect. This isn't good enough. And you know, there's degrees of perfectionism. Like I've had a client before in high school that like couldn't write his name neatly enough on his homework. And so he'd write it out, erase it, write it, erase it until the paper was frayed. And so that's really extreme perfectionism. Right. I'm talking about kind of more general, more everyday perfectionism. But I think to the extent that we're shooting for perfect, it can paralyze us. And so you want to guard against that. And, and one of the ways to do it is to focus on the mantra, settle for good enough. Right. To remind yourself that good enough is often good enough. I mean, if you're putting out a product, uh, an online video course, for example, if I shoot for perfect in that, I will never get it out. And then it helps nobody. Right. Whereas if I can get it to 90, 95% and it's good enough, I can put that out and help 10,000 people. And so I, I think just giving yourself permission or room to be less than perfect can be really helpful. So, you know, and, and good enough could be 95% for you or 90 or 85. It depends on the context. But I think just being aware of that dynamic and giving yourself permission to, yeah, to be less than perfect is a little bit freeing. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. And as I make a video introduction to welcome people into this course and, and tape myself, you know, you've got that inner critic and, and all those worst case scenarios. And, you know, you wouldn't get a video out if, uh, uh, if you were trying to get it perfect. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, um, one of those one of those things to, to work around to make sure that you get the the message out there and, and similar we've, we've probably had like a couple internet hiccups where the video is going to go a little fuzzy uh, in this in this interview but you know it's not going to stop it yeah when i mean being on video is very difficult like i've struggled with that myself and you know and, and i think that's partly perfectionism partly self-consciousness partly worry about you know being judged negatively but it's it's scary it's a vulnerable act to put yourself on video and put yourself out on the internet yep but i think uh it's valuable because uh, hopefully the, the people listening, uh, this will ring true and they'll, they'll get some value out of it. So uh, it's all about, um, you know, being our best and, and, and playing a, a bigger game to, uh, you know, help people out. Absolutely. Cool. Um, all right. Do you have uh, a offer for our audience today? Uh, yes, I do. Actually, I've got a talk on mindset, the power of mindset. Um, and what we're finding out about mindset, it's the, kind of the foundational skill for success. Right. So it's getting the mind, correct mindset is what underlies other high achieving traits like perseverance, effort, grit, resiliency. Um, so there's, you know, if you'd like to, you can go to the website. Uh, I'm, I'm not, the website going to be listed? Yeah, I'll provide the link in the email. Okay, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but <laughs> um, you can go to the website and you know, if, if you put in your name and email, then you'll get instant access to a free download of an MP4. It's um, me talking over PowerPoint presentation on fixed versus growth mindset. Awesome. Awesome. Help people grow. It's a beautiful thing. Um, really appreciate your, your time and, and your wisdom. Uh, I think it's going to be really valuable for people. And, uh, you know, I don't know who doesn't have anxiety or who can't help um, you know, who can't use the help to change their mindset. So really appreciate all the knowledge that you shared with us today. 
Well, thanks for so much for having me on, Ben. It's been great.